everyone, and welcome to The Propcast. My name is Louisa Dickens, co-founder of LMR Ray and board director of the UKPA, and I shall be your weekly host. Each week for 30 minutes, we'll be connecting the VCs, prop tech startups, and real estate professionals globally, and assist in bridging that famous communication gap we all love talking about. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the PropCast. And today we're joined by Dan Drogman, CEO of Smart Spaces, and James Pellack, Director of Workplace and Innovation at Great Portland State. And we will be talking about how to make the workplace smarter. So welcome to the show. Hi, I'm Lisa. Hi there. Now, let me give you a brief introduction to our two guests. So Dan is a software development entrepreneur and CEO of Smart Spaces. He provides leading owners and developers of real estate with smart building solutions, working on the central London portfolio for Great Portland Estates, PLC, which we'll hear much more about in a bit, Ashby Capital, Hedical, and many, many more accounts. The Smart Spaces enables building owners to add an extra dimension to their services via its Internet of Things cloud-based platform, smartphone app, and digital twin, giving clients 360-degree engagement with and control of their office environment. From a secure automated entry system to control of lighting and heating and connecting with the office concierge, the technology is revolutionizing the role of the traditional building owner and what it means to come back to work, which is hopefully fairly soon. Now, James is Director of Workplace and Innovation at Great Portland Estates PLC, which is a REIT with a focus purely on the ownership, management and development of commercial real estate in central London. Now, Great Portland Estates have an open-minded approach to innovation and believe strongly in working with their suppliers to implement technology or innovation wherever it is suited to their portfolio. Great Portland Estates were the first property company to roll out a workplace experience app across their portfolio, which they developed in conjunction with Smart Spaces since they first started working together back in 2016, which is probably one of the first movers to sort of really roll out one of these experience apps. James's role is fairly uh, varied, but his sort of role at Great Portland Estates is to observe emerging trends around workplace and combine them with the best available technology to ensure that Great Portland Estates product stays ahead of occupier need. So thank you both for uh, joining the show. I thought maybe a good way for us to, I guess, give the audience a better introduction to how you guys link together is, you know, Dan, why don't you kickstart us with how did the partnership between Smart Spaces and Great Portland Estates first come about? You know, what's the, what's the story behind it? No, definitely. So thanks, uh, Louisa. So, yeah, essentially a long time ago when I started out in this industry as a software developer writing software such as the, uh, we, we built actually the Knight Frank Hotels data rooms to, to sell assets. Uh, and whilst working on those sort of projects, we were working on a lot of commercial mar- uh, property marketing projects. And there I got introduced to uh, Stephen Mew, who was at Mackay Securities. And Stephen's always sort of been an early adopter of technology and is passionate about technology. And so he'd always continuously be asking, what are we building? What are we doing? What are we thinking of? What are we doing from clients? Can you show us like what, what sort of projects you're working on? So like really interested in like the innovation side. And so we built a load of crazy different things, space planning applications where you could design your office applications to be able to provide offers into retail uh, locations. And whilst doing that, he actually ended up moving and going from uh, Mackay to GPE. And when he moved to GPE, the focus became predominantly offices. And that's where we got introduced to James. And obviously, GP being the scale of the business it is, was, was able to start rapidly deploy our technology across their buildings. Also, the best thing was they had that trust where I'd worked with Stephen for such a long time they could have that trust in us to really give us sort of a a free remit to go into their buildings and develop this technology. You know, we we just got given the keys to 240 Black Fries and said, right, there we go, make that smart. And so, you know, (laughs) what? yeah, it's um, definitely, uh, you know, great to have that confidence in us. And yeah, working across the free early assets, that's exactly what we did. And I think really, I think at that point, it's probably good to hand to James now to sort of say, because that's when I, we started working with James and sort of what happened there. So James, do you want to continue from where I got to? <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, it was that, that, that describes the background great clearly. And when we, when I first met Dan, 
I had a different role at GP. I was head of project, so I was responsible for the delivery of all of our development program. And so there was quite a lot of focus on the new developments. So as well as 240, we looked at another building called 55 Well Street. And the thing I was always impressed about with Dan was that his, his can-do attitude. And I've always been really excited by the, the, the possibilities. And I always get really frustrated by the, frust- the uh, inefficiencies within our industry. And so we started work on a project at 55 Well Street, which was a uh, relatively small little office block. And if I'm completely honest, I didn't fully believe that Dan could deliver what he promised he could deliver. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it was, but with his tenacity, but I think also the great thing about GPE is the, the sort of open and fair attitude that we have. Uh, I wouldn't say we just let him go. <laughs> I think there was a bit more control on it than that. But um, but working with some of my colleagues, so there's many, many names to mention, but Ian, the project manager for the building at the time, Steve Rollingson, the head of IT, we all th- sort of thought about this and thought about the logic and tried to make it work. And it was bringing the expertise of how a building gets put together, how all of the intelligent wiring from the BMS works, uh, and then Dan's expertise in creating the API for the building works. And it's that collaboration which has helped us to really accelerate. And so we we did 55 Well Street, we sold that building. And then we, the next one we did was 160 Old Street. And we've just carried on and on. And as soon as we could show our colleagues 160 Old Street and show it working, we all believed in it. And Stephen, being the back of the day, thought, right, okay, we're not just going to roll this into one building, we're going to put it into every building in a portfolio. So now... Every one of our occupiers has uh, Sesame, uh, which is our branded version of that that workplace app. And it has different levels of smart and different levels of control, depending on the age of the building. James, could you uh, tell the audience, some of our audience, they're in the US, they're in APAC. Could you uh, go, kind of describe them how big and varied your portfolio oh, yeah, okay. is? Yeah, because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're that world famous portfolio. So <laughs> actually, it's one of our strengths, I think. So we, as you mentioned in the introduction, we, are, we, we have a focus purely on central London. We are a real estate investment trust, and we own about two and a half million square feet of offices uh, and retail space in about across 30 to around 30 different properties, basically. Mm. So it's, it's a wide and varied portfolio. It's from the West End to the East of London. We have all different ages, types, new buildings, old buildings, buildings that are in the development pipeline. So we're always looking at the life cycle of an asset and and looking at ways that we can unlock potential uh, to create space for London to thrive. And um, now, Dan, tell us um, from your point of view, and also you can probably delve into your point a little bit more, you know, what makes a space smart? And surely there's so many different elements to it. Yeah, no, definitely. The, the, I think what makes the space smart is using technology to make life easier. So the smart piece is the technology working in the background uh, to provide services to you, which are more accessible. Uh, and that could be, you know, accessing the building, for instance, on large buildings like 160 Old Street, you know, you can have over 2000 people working in the building. Going to get your badge and pass for that building is quite an onerous process. You know, a person needs to be introduced to the building management team, uh, to the security office. A photograph needs to be taken, a card, plastic card needs to be printed. Obviously, there's a sustainability element to that as well. And so what we're able to do just in the first instance, just through the access, is by people self-registering for the app in the app store, getting an approval via the GP management team that they are the person they say they are and they have um, they work for the company they do. They then get given their access completely um, remotely so it's sent directly to their smartphone and from then on they can access the building so straight away you've streamlined that process you know you could onboard a thousand people to the building easily in a few hours uh, of the morning the building opens so, so that's where it sort of starts and then it expands from there into their space but the key is obviously gpe provide a, a the space but there's services that come with that space so if it's a cat a space they're providing there's going to be lighting hvac energy meters now sometimes for the, a landlord or sorry or an occupier moving into this space to get those services to work for them um, and obviously at the same time gp can't give free control to a tenant taking one floor to the entire building what our technology enables them to do is to access their services within their own space within um, the right parameters that still keep the, the, the building um, energy efficient 
gives them free control. So actually they feel in control. You know, they're taking the lease of their space. They can control their HVAC from an app or from a web portal. They can control their lighting and they can see their energy feedback. And then at that point, what we do is our platform expands and starts to deliver things like desk booking, meeting room booking. Uh, and the, the benefits of adding that to our system versus using an external system is when someone badges in uh, downstairs on the turnstiles, for instance, we automatically check them in for their desk. We know they've arrived. And so you start to create those cause and effect relationships where the building and the office within the building are working harmoniously. And that just keeps getting extended and extended. For instance, if I create a meeting room booking, it automatically sends out the visitor invites to the external parties or creates a Zoom room for the people using the remote video conferencing. So yeah, that is what I believe uh, is what makes the space smart. So it's technology working on behalf of the building uh, to make life easier. James, what about your clients? What do they look for in a smart building? And is there, are there certain parts of um, the product which maybe get used a little bit more or are mm. yeah, slightly more appealing to them? Yeah, that's a great question. So, I mean, just if we took a slightly step back, so the, the reason why we did this is not just for the sake of technologies and it's what, what are we trying to do? So what we're trying to make are schemes that fulfill our occupiers' needs and help users thrive by enhancing their everyday experience. And so we're trying to wake, take away the pain points every day from that journey. And the, the Workplace app is a good place to start at that point, but it is also combined with the aesthetics and what it looks like. So people need spaces that are welcome and, and they're exciting to be in. So it's not just about the tech space. It's got to be, why do I want to be there now more than ever? What makes the commute worth it? And those spaces that are that are sustainable, focus on well-being and technology are all really increasingly popular things. You can't say that there's one thing for one occupier, that that's what they want. Um, and we, we're having to guess this. But those are the broad themes. And if we can get everything right, then then we, we know that we're starting to stand out from our competitors. So the different features that we provide in Sesame, so we provide a basic offer, offer uh, of all the things that we're doing. So... This is a good example of how the um, how the benefits work. So we, we, one of my colleagues, David Sullivan, he introduced um, the concept of free magazines. So that's why on Sesame you get access to uh, 150 different magazines from around the world, and so staff can read them and download them at any time. That's very popular, and you need to give people at least two or three reasons to use the app to really get engagement up. So we're looking to constantly offer new, new info. So in terms of during the pandemic, we've introduced air quality sensors. So you get an air quality feed onto your, so you know what the air quality is like in the office. You know what the transport journey is like. So how busy is the tube for your journey? And so it's just helping that whole process from home to the back to the workplace uh, and doing that in a safe and secure way. So I, I wouldn't say there's one thing, but there's many things. And then on top of that, what we're starting to see, uh, so we've got three, three occupiers now who want to build on our platform uh, and build on their own services. And that's when you add on for them, the desk booking, meeting room booking, utilization studies, voice activated control, follow me printing. And so with a couple of occupiers, KKR, Hanover Square and Glencore, they're both, they're both taking on board the app. And we've got one more that we're in negotiation with this week that we would hope we can't quite announce because we're not quite there, but we're we're really excited by that possibility. So that there's, there's a lot to come. And then the key thing, the other feature that we didn't anticipate, but we have worked out that we should provide is to white label the app. So KKR, for example, started off on the journey that they wanted to, they had a workplace experience up in New York that they thought they could use. They weren't as advanced as smart spaces. They couldn't get as close to what smart spaces could provide and so that has gone in reverse and that's that's an important point about being open-minded to that possibility because when an occupier is in a multi uh, city location they may just want their company branded app and that's fine by us as long as the staff are happy uh, and they're coming into our buildings that's great and it's good for them too yeah i'm sure it's also a way of reassuring your clients it's a way of them getting back to work getting back to the buildings in a safe exactly environment right far more controlled and, and measured. Position yourself to thrive with a five-week course that covers the essentials of designing, developing, 
marketing and operating offices in 2021 and beyond. Check out the Future Proof Office course at realinnovationacademy.com. Quote LMRE for a 10% discount. Now, Dan, given smart space is growing rapidly, I think you sort of briefly mentioned for the call, you know, you're expanding to the US. Who are your clients and, you know, how do they vary across across the business? Yeah, there's actually, yeah, I think definitely since COVID, uh, the adoption of this kind of technology has increased. So, so the client that we didn't have pre-COVID was Canary Wolf Group. So they come to us uh, and we're looking to roll out a contactless entry solution. And uh, it was based on our work we'd done at 160 Ultra of GPE. They, they thought that would be the ideal solution to fit their building, which was great because it's a building of scale. So it was already incredibly busy during lockdown just because of the nature of how big the estate is and how many buildings they wanted to integrate. We were quite pleased that we managed to do that remotely. That in turn introduced us to the US, to Brookfield, uh, where we're working for a project with them there. And what's interesting about different clients, you have like, we have a lot of clients, you know, we're really pleased with how things are growing. Some are incredibly hands on, like James, which is amazing. Some are just really happy just to have an app and then they, their building management team run with it, but they don't really have influence so much what sort of features are coming into the app and and then others have quite big internal software development teams so they have a lot of custom integrations Mm. i think the best thing is what james touched on which is the fact that we're now starting to do a lot more work for the occupier and i think there was a lot of second guessing with this in the early stages and we're so delighted that you know james and his team took the risk with us because we were sort of trying to second guess what the occupier really wanted. You know, we'd formulated this product thinking this is brilliant. This is what the occupier needs. It wasn't until we started to get this uptake and then subsequently further proof that they weren't actually fully integrated into their own space that we're delighted that we've like dreamt up a product, developed it, and now we've got a demand for it, not only at the landlord side, but at the occupier side. So I'd say around new business that we're growing in the UK is very much leaning towards towards that occupier side. And that's like, you know, that's just more of those desperate things. So a lot of people are looking at the activity-based work uh, place. So they're trying to optimize the existing space of get, get more people into the same space, which means you have to hot desk, you have to provide desk booking, but all this can sit on the same platform. And so it's taking the plug and play sort of fit out that's happening and the, the flex space is taking a similar approach to technology. And what's, what are you sort of seeing over in the US in terms of sort of clients? Is there a sort of target you have over there or is it a similar sort of growth plan that you've seen in the UK? Oh, I would say that the businesses interested in us in the States are actually looking to operate Flex. So they're looking to introduce Flex in their portfolio. And so a lot of the, the software there is how we can connect the landlord services, just like we have James and his buildings. So your access control, light control, HVAC to your ways of running the space and then that goes beyond desk looking and metering booking that's starting to look at billing so them to collect their rent payments just having payments available within the app so definitely that's where we see sort of mm. the big change in the us at the moment yeah i think it's interesting always comparing uh, the different sort of markets when it when it comes down to innovation and uptake and technology james i'd love to hear from you, you know how how would uh, Great Portland in the States measure success? Or and you can also maybe uh, go into your biggest achievement with SMART. I think the measure, I think success to us is, is, a, is a satisfied occupier. That's ultimately yep. why we're doing this. It's, and I can't say that we've, we've achieved it yet. I'm not saying we've got unhappy occupiers, but we, we're, I mean, we're still at baby steps. And this is, I guess, one of those key prop tech lessons as i said dan and i've been working out with each other for four years and we're only sort of really developing these products now and because it does take time for us to develop the buildings to put them in but it's going to take even more time what you know what we've continued to do over the next three to four years we'll learn even more and and it may be that you know what what our guests that that what occupiers wanted they they weren't actually that bothered about this but i don't we don't think that's right we think I think the hunch is that they will get it and they, they will appreciate it. And what we learn and how we shape a product is there and we can close that feedback loop. I mean, I think our biggest achievement to date is is just finished. Uh, so we did it during lockdown. We completed a building called the Hickman. Yep. The Hickman's in Whitechapel and it is our definitely our smartest building to date. It is, we bought it with with, with the thought that we would make it as innovative and open as we could. It doesn't have a reception, for example. It is a totally new arrival experience for an office building. It is 
focus around sustainability, well-being, and all of the things I was mentioning before. We put our own. We've now twenty percent of our portfolio is now uh, flex space that we we either directly operate or we're operating with a partner. So that part of the building is that built in. And we've just signed an occupier to the top floor called Four Communications. They've moved from another part of the portfolio. And the really exciting part of that is that that they're they're open and willing to share the learning experience. So where I'm really excited is that uh, we're combining the, the the help that Dan's given us. We're building on the BIM model that we already had. So we're building a digital twin. And what we can really start to do is develop the machine learning because the next thing that we, you know, sustainability is a massive focus for us. Mm. Uh, we've had some major announcements this year in that field. But the key to this is, is how can we engage with our occupiers so that they can also take part in that journey, that they can understand how they're consuming energy and help us work together to reduce that consumption. And that's that's the really, really exciting possibility. And, and I'd hope, you know, when we're talking to you in a year or two's time, that that's where we're at. And that we're really learning and punk, punking this learning into our <laughs> development pipeline as well, because we're starting, then we've got some possibilities about machine learning and using all this data that we're starting to get to, to really, really optimize this building. So that's the excitement. Coming forward. I guess finally making use of all the data you have. James, it's great to yeah. see the estate sort of pushing forward and becoming far more innovative, which obviously you are the driving force behind it. Would the a question which is often asked is what how can you make a business innovate? You know, what sort of really sort of pushes it forward when I go into the sort of pitch about trying to get business higher ahead of innovation or a uh, transformation manager, it's very much comes down to getting sign off from senior management. Does the CEO, is he fully on board with it, you know, invest willing to invest a hell of a lot of money because it's it's not cheap, is it? Obviously yeah. there's a ma- senior management at Great Portland Saints must be com- completely on board with this a digitalization strategy. Yeah, we are. Yeah. So it is. I mean, we started this conversation, as I said, back in 2016, but around the same time when I could see this disruption coming at us. And that that discussion that I had with Toby started this role. And I, I could see the things that were coming towards us that were going to cause us some pain. And if we didn't innovate, <laughs> then, we, then we'd die. Right. So it was that point of, well, we'd slowly die, but we, we, we should embrace it. And, and our values are there, you know, that we, we, we embrace mm-hmm. the opportunity. And this is in our DNA. It is 100% through the business. So yes, it's supported by senior management. The culture of innovation, they are, they are excited by it. We are all excited by it. And the great thing is this year is that I realized that in order to implement uh, innovation throughout the business is that we ask for volunteers and we ask for what we call innovation champions through each different part of the business who've got an interest in this. And we've got 28 so that's about a quarter of our workforce who are interested in this in some way. And it's using them to input into the test cases and use cases. And it means that when we found some new new uh, innovation or new companies from our investment in Pi Labs, for example, that we I hadn't even considered that we would implement at the beginning of the year, we have met them and started to test it and trial it as we've gone forward. So it's started... It, the, the snowball's rolling down the hill and it's, it's really gathering momentum. And you mentioned the culture of the business, obviously integrating technology. How have you found getting the, I guess, the wider business to adopt it and on board with it? Has there been any challenges with that? I think there's a stereotype of obviously real estate being fairly traditional, but estates particularly being a bit slightly more archaic. <laughs> Forgive me for saying that, but have you, have you found yeah. any challenges there or how, how have you gone about that? Well, so what the, there's two ways to go about it. I mean, the first thing is that although I mean it's a piece of marketing, it and there is a Duke of Portland somewhere, but it's you know it's not a landed estate, so it is it's actually a very relatively young company, and so it it, it is perhaps more open minded than than our brand would suggest. But the but equally the what I learned was there's smarting small, starting the trials very small scale, being afraid to to learn, being afraid to fail and learning from the mistakes. And that's exactly what we did with Dan. We learned early on. I'm sure Dan learned stuff from us. 
uh, and it was a two-way relationship and you know we don't we like to say that we don't have a monopoly on a good idea and it's the, that dialogue and discussion that that really promotes the product and it's being afraid to fail but the consequences of it aren't that big and most people in real estate don't have brilliant imaginations some of the conversations when i'm talking about some concepts and digitization i get a few baffled looks by because it's new to people they don't <laughs> understand it right? but it's but you have to learn to frame it and you have to show an example about what's the problem you're trying to solve what does it look like and as soon as people see it then they actually want to embrace mm. it and that was absolutely the case with with sesame that it was may may 2018 that we demonstrated this at 160 old street and i remember in, in the meeting room we did it and from that moment with the buy-in was massive and everybody wanted it immediately um, um, and you have to show it. You have to show it, really. It's, it's where you get to. And quick question. Where did um, the name Sesame come from? Is there a story behind that? or <laughs> This is, this is, well, it was just, it was the automatic opening. So it was open Sesame. Uh -huh. That was it. So you could, you can literally walk up to a door and say open Sesame and your Bluetooth would let you in. Ah, I like that. Now, what was it like for you transitioning from software development to a fan in, obviously, proved C? D2, but to becoming a founder of a uh, property technology company. So I'm sure you've obviously been on, on board with the digitalization of the industry. Obviously, have you had many obstacles sort of pitching your product as well? Because not everyone sees, sees the future probably quite like you do. Yeah, well, I wish I could see the future even better. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, definitely. I mean, it's, it's been really interesting. I, uh, it's funny enough when the term prop tech come around, I was quite like, like it sort of like, wow, I've been doing this prop tech for a, lot, a long time and the term's only just come up now. Um, and uh, there are a few um, veterans in the industry like me. And I think when we started the company, it was me and my brother, Tom, who founded the business. He's a fellow software developer. I could be quite envious of Tom at times because I was wearing a few hats doing the sales in some of the accounts and some of the more boring things around running business. And I think the best thing to happen is and this is sort of that transition from D2 to smart spaces, is when you can focus your entire company on a single product, you can make it the best product in the market. And what that's done is that's won us a lot of clients, that's grown the business, and now the business has got to the size where actually I have a sales team, I have a HR team, I have a project management team, I have accounts. And so now we feel like a fully-fledged organisation and quite cheekily, um, being CEO, I can get away with um, working on the things I'm quite passionate about. So mm. I have a lot of airtime with my uh, development team. Uh, they probably might tell you they don't enjoy it as much as I do because um, <laughs> uh, we, we have a daily stand up. Um, we don't use Scrum methodology, we use Kanban um, because obviously we have changing priorities all the time. But I will join those meetings. And if I don't join, it can be done easily, probably in about 15 minutes or 20 minutes. If I join, it tends to go to about an hour and 10 because I want inch degree detail and everything. But, you know, it does end up coming out in the product uh, and I enjoy that incredibly. I don't write any code anymore, which also my team are very happy about because there's a lot less bugs. But actually, funny enough, my brother um, is very hands-on. You know, he's, he's embedded into the software team uh, and we're heavily weighted towards engineering. So, you know, more than, say, I think 70% of our workforce are engineers. Uh, yeah. And that's how we sort of can pick up these projects with James. We can work on them quickly. We can find solutions. And actually, that's another thing actually it's worth mentioning is by focusing on this single product, you can attract better talent, something that you know you know all about. Um, and actually, for you as a sales pitch, recruiting for us can go out to the market and say, well, look, these guys are the best at what they do, and this is their, their product. And I think it makes it a much easier way to convince people to join the business mm. when uh, on the old software development side where you're doing lots of varied projects. Yeah, I think it can be much harder to attract talent. I think that's helped us retain talent as well. You know, I think we've got more than half the company have been with us for like eight years as well, which is amazing. Oh, that's impressive. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but we, we keep feeding them with innovation. It's helpful to have a client like James who keeps dreaming up these ideas and telling us because <laughs> they like it because they're like, oh, yeah, no, that's good. You know, James had this amazing idea during lockdown to with the open data that the government provide around how busy tube station was. And uh, he showed us and he had like this um, Power BI that TFL had created and it was really, uh, you know, they'd really sort of undersold the power of the data there, you know. But James see that and thought, well, you, we can make much better use of this in our app. And so now in the app, we have a fully fledged station finder where if I search all day now, I can see um, how quiet the tube station is. 
uh, make an informed decision whether I want to leave now while it's quiet or later when it's slightly busier. So, uh, yeah, that is sort of what I found like. So actually, I'm enjoying it now more than ever. Well, that, that's good to hear. Guys, we're coming to the end of the podcast, but um, why don't we round off with, have you, either of you got any tips or, for people entering this space? Maybe James, if you want to go first. Stay open-minded. Listen to your advisors. Keep your data. Keep your data. That must be a big one. <laughs> 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 and Dan? <laughs> yeah, I suppose my, my advice to say companies similar to mine come into a space like PropTech, I think that really just, you know, work as hard as you can for your clients and deliver what they want. You know, I see so many software companies that push back to the uh, client and say, no, you're wrong. We're right. We're the experts. And you think, well, hang on, you're a prop tech company that's just started. These guys have been doing this property gig for a long time. Work with them rather than try and tell them that tech's going to transform their lives and yeah, <laughs> uh, push it, push back. So that's what I'd say, yeah, be amenable is one of my... Uh, and I just to add, I think also be patient because <laughs> I, I sort of get, I get a bit prickly about this, but when people sort of say, oh, you know, property companies are so boring, so dead, so stick, you know, take so slow. It's because real estate is slow. It isn't, it's not a quick, it's not a fast transacting business. So it doesn't, mm. those events and making these things happen don't happen quickly. So it, it does take a longer, it takes more stamina uh, to get going with it, I think. It's the, it's the other thing I'd add. And also for our audience, can you please let them know the best way to connect with you and your businesses? Um, Speak Dan. to Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Speak to Dan. <laughs> yeah, no, for, for me, LinkedIn, always Dan Drogman, LinkedIn. The best thing about having a surname, Drogman, is if you get, if you put that into Google, they're all my relations. There's no Drogmans out there I'm not related <laughs> to. Uh, so yeah, Dan Drogman, LinkedIn's best way to connect or our website, smart, uh, smartspaces.app. Awesome. And uh, yeah, for me, I guess the same thing, having a, a, a fairly unique surname, LinkedIn or uh, via a website, all the details are there and on Twitter as well. So at James Pallet, it's pretty much every single handle I have. Beautiful. Well, look, uh, thank you both for coming on the podcast. I'm looking forward to catching up with you after the show. Brilliant. Thanks, Louise. Cool. Thanks. Thank you for joining us this week on the PropCast and a big thanks to our special guests. Make sure you visit our website, www.nmre.co.uk, where you can subscribe to our show or you'll find us on iTunes and Spotify where all good content is found. Whilst you're at it, if you found value in the show, we'd appreciate it if you could rate and review us on iTunes or if you simply just spread the word. Be sure to tune in next Tuesday and I'll catch you later. Hi, this is Nelson from Property Quants. I'd like to invite you to join our Introduction to Data Science and Machine Learning for Real Estate seminar. To learn more, visit propertyquants.com slash seminar and use special code LMRE20 on Eventbrite for a discount. You're listening to a podcast company podcast. This was made by Podcast Syndicator, where we help you go from start to grow to making money with your podcast. Let us help you share your message and your voice with the world. Reach out now, Jason at podcastsyndicator.com or Brett at podcastsyndicator.com to find out more. Thank you for listening and do come back to hear nothing but the best podcasts.